this week we <clears throat> observe uh, the 27th Sunday of the uh, year. And the readings, uh, interestingly, sometimes, as you know, the first reading uh, is chosen to match some aspect uh, or insight into the uh, gospel. And this uh, week, actually the choice, not only of the uh, first reading, which comes from Isaiah chapter five, but also the Psalm verse uh, is connected with the theme or the idea of the uh, gospel. And it might be interesting to note that we traditionally have always said that there are three readings uh, given on a given Sunday, one from the Old Testament and then two from the New Testament. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you think about it, and it isn't as stressed perhaps in our Catholic tradition as it is in some of the other mainline Christian churches, but the response psalm, which uh, is a work that comes from the Old Testament. So in fact, from the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, each week, we really have four readings, although the second reading is chosen to be and should be generally some, and that we do, although with the limitations of the uh, <coughs> coronavirus uh, singing, uh, that psalm is not as easily done uh, as perhaps in the past. But my point being as we start, that there is a good connection between both Old Testament or Hebrew readings and the gospel reading. So along with the um, reading from Isaiah and Psalm uh, 80 is uh, a section from Paul's letter to the Philippians, of chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, and then the gospel again from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 43. This time, we really pick up in the uh, gospel tradition from where we were last week. In fact, I may have mentioned that there are three parables that are linked together here. Uh, last week we heard the first parable, now this week is the second parable, uh, known as sometimes by different names as the wicked tenants or the treacherous tenants. And uh, it is built on <clears throat> a, a, a fact that uh, should always be kept in mind here, and I will come back to this a couple of times as we look at this section of Matthew's story, that the parables, these three, in fact, on the second one today, are levied against the leadership of the Hebrew community, uh, pictured as being part of Jesus' time, and also could well have been part of the time of Matthew. But the accusations are not against Judaism but rather against certain leadership within Judaism, as I mentioned, at the time of Jesus or at the time of Matthew. Because over the centuries, sometimes these sayings and teachings of Jesus have been directed against the whole of Israel, the whole of Judaism, and that has caused considerable problems and terrible relationships between Judaism and Christianity. So I mention this again, probably may mention it again toward the end, because uh, otherwise, with an uncritical listening and reading of Matthew's story, it looks as if Jesus continually attacks Judaism, where in fact he is continually pictured as being concerned with the lack of good leadership uh, exercised by those who are responsible for this. So all of that is a kind of, a, again, a little reminder and a little uh, background. It's the chief priests and the elders who receive, and that's mentioned in the scripture itself, the uh, kind of message that the parable is teaching. Also, the parable chosen today uh, is a, an example of the use of allegory. Now, we've mentioned this before, and often parables of Jesus are not generally uh, given to allegorism. 
But in this case, in Matthew, picking up, by the way, the story uh, from the Mark and tradition, <clears throat> much more tends to allegorize than even uh, Mark had done. What allegory you, you remember is that it as assigns to different aspects of the story, different persons or places, meanings that are to be understood as listening to and interpreting uh, the particular parable. Also, this particular parable tends to be what we would call, here's an, a little bit of a nickel word, more Christological. It is more interested in something about who Jesus is than sometimes other aspects of parables are concerned. So it's a story again of a vineyard. And the idea of a vineyard is, as uh, I alluded to at the beginning, a very much part of the Hebrew tradition. In fact, uh, and this is why <clears throat> the uh, choice of a selection from Isaiah is uh, important here. Um, but where to start? All right, that there is this vineyard and <clears throat> the landowner uh, ten has some tenants who work the, the vineyard. And at the time of the harvest, <clears throat> he sends, now I will go back in a minute and kind of explain <clears throat> both the historical aspect of this and then the allegoricalness of how it is uh, chosen. The vineyard uh, produces its uh, grapes, and <clears throat> the uh, owner uh, sends uh, someone to collect his grapes or his share of the vineyard. And uh, when he does that, the tenants kind of say, we're not going to do this anymore. And they hurt severely those who were sent to get <clears throat> what belongs to the vineyard owner. Well, he sends more, and that doesn't work either. They just get as nasty to him. And then he thinks, I will send my son, and certainly they'll pay attention to him. And when the tenants see the son coming, they say, ah, here comes the son. Let us kill him. And then the vineyard might be ours. And uh, with that in mind, the, when that happens, rather, then the owner of the vineyard sends his own uh, persons in and drives not only them out, but really hurts them. And uh, that kind of is the gist of the, uh, of the parable. Now, I encourage you. I'm always a little careful here when I interpret things that I leave out parts, so I put emphasis on parts that, uh, you know, maybe y you would miss. So I encourage you to read it. I know that many of you do have the text before you, and that will give you um, a, a little better uh, background for this. Now, what it says, and this part we are somewhat uh, sure of, is that there was an owner who had this vineyard. Now, as I alluded to uh, in another talk, vineyards took time to develop. But as it is mentioned here, the owner um, puts a hedge around it, creates a wine press, <clears throat> and puts a tower, all of this, in the vineyard. Now, why would you put this hedge around? Well, the hedge was put around to keep animals out. So that, and this is the historical part that would certainly be familiar with uh, persons in the New Testament times. Then he puts a wine press there. So what would happen is when the grapes were picked, then very often they would be turned into uh, wine, and the press, of course, would crush the grapes, and the juice of the grapes would then go into vats that were um, uh, available, and the wine was made. Now, I, <laughs> I laugh a little bit. Be careful when you see them crushing the grapes that you don't um, automatically think of those old uh, 
Love Lucy stories where she's chomping around, crushing the grapes. But in fact, that is often was the way it was done. But a wine press was much more effective and <clears throat> the usual way and it was it was done. And then there was a tower. Now, what was the tower for? Well, the tower was placed usually at the edge of the um, <clears throat> vineyard. It would be, first of all, uh, they could kind of look, see if any outsiders were coming that they didn't like. But the tower also became a place to keep the wine that was now made. And it also provided uh, a place to live in for the vineyard workers, the tenants, while it was going on. So all of that we know historically was uh, uh, something that uh, took place. And what had also happened is the owner of the vineyard was pretty well off. Many people who earlier on had perhaps owned property themselves lost it because of, believe it or not, a tax system. And the tax system that we know was going on in the first century world could be quite heavy. Um, one half to two thirds of whatever income people made would go to taxes. So we think we have it bad sometimes. It was not any better back in those times. The Romans received tribute. There was a tax that had to be paid to Rome. Payment had to be made to King Herod and his protectors in their time. And then the land which the, the tenants worked on, they had rent that had to be paid to the owner. So when you think about it, when you put all that together, uh, taxes were quite uh, heavy and uh, made for difficult difficulties. So the economic background of the first century here comes in, into place. Uh, also, there were other natural factors. There sometimes famine struck, sometimes there was a lack of rain, but mostly it was the heavy taxes that made life difficult for the tenants who may have owned property themselves, but earlier on unable to uh, pay for the taxes, unable to keep up with things, then kind of became workers for the owner and they got a, a salary from that. And that's kind of how life uh, um, transpired. So, uh, the vineyard. Now, where does the allegory come from? Or let's back go first to the section from the prophet Isaiah, who talks about the fact, and here's where Psalm 80 comes in at the very fact that Israel had been transplanted from Egypt, that it, it uh, therefore thinks of the whole Israelite people as the vineyard of God. And so the owner of the vineyard or the master of the vineyard would, was God. And as you read through Isaiah's a little section that is chosen here, the uh, vineyard, that would be Israel, are not too loyal or faithful to the Lord. He, in fact, God is saying, I planted a people, I did all the work, here again, going back to what I mentioned a couple minutes ago, I dug around, I got it all ready, I got the soil ready, and I expected that Israel would come out to be the rich grapes uh, of goodness that I expected. Instead, what I got were the translation used is wild grapes. The perhaps more accurate translation is rotten grapes. So you can see it was, <laughs> it was even the smell of it. And um, God is pictured as really saying, I'm angry about this and disturbed about this. And what God would send to the vineyard, Israel, were prophets. And what did they do to prophets? They refused to listen and sometimes even persecuted prophets. So you see, you, you kind of get the connection now to the parable that Jesus teaches, is telling, and this uh, background from uh, the, the Isaiah. And um, 
I thought for a moment that also, as I mentioned at the beginning, to look at Psalm 80, because Psalm 80 turns out to be what we call a communal uh, lament. Namely, it was a national uh, psalm used when things went badly within Israel's history. Now, um, in the little section that's given for this week, it uh, picks up with a phrase that occurs three times within the psalm. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine on us that we may be saved. So it, it often was used at a time of difficulty, and it was a hope that perhaps as the community prayed, God would again come and help them. So God, in the, in the script, in both in this psalm, is pictured as the shepherd, of course, a very popular image of God, and as the vine keeper. And uh, so at the same time that Israel has created a problem in, in refusing to accept God's message and live God's ways, also becomes a solution that although terrible things happen, God will also act as a savior and as a help. So encourage uh, a little section here of how the psalm works, and it kind of gives a good background for the parable today. A vineyard from Egypt you transplanted, you drove away the nations and planted it. It put forth its foliage to the sea, it shoots as far as the river. So interestingly, the psalm here pictures Israel as being all the way from the Red Sea to the Euphrates. So it was a large area that originally seems to have been part of the thinking here. Why have you broken down its walls so that every passerby plucks its fruit? The boar from the forest lays its waste and the beasts of the field feed upon it. Once again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. So you see, now we move to asking God for healing and help. Take care of this vine and protect what your right hand has planted, the Son of Man, whom you yourself made strong. Then we will no longer withdraw from you. Give us new life, and we will call upon your name. O God, Lord of hosts, restore us. If your face shine upon us, then we shall be saved. So all of the, this fits together now with the little parable that Jesus has taught. Now I mentioned that uh, this parable fits into the category of what we call allegory. So how does this work? Well, the vineyard is considered here to be Israel. That's true, okay? The landowner is God. The slaves or the workers are the prophets. And the son, of course, is Jesus. Now you can see how the allegorical meaning takes place. First, they refuse. They do harm to those who are sent. Here again is the sense of the prophets. Perhaps even John the Baptist is brought into this as one of those who are set, sent rather to help them kind of change their ways. And what lies at root here allegorically is that in a, as this message is being directed to the leadership, the hope is that they will change their mind. Again, similar to the earlier parable of last week, that it's possible, now all is not lost forever. As Israel in the little sections that we have heard had turned away from God, God when asked decides and helps and comes to bring uh, safety and help to them. Well, um, they send the uh, second group into the vineyard to get what is due to the owner and again, the tenants. Who are the tenants? See, the tenants are those who are leaders. They are not doing what they should be doing. And they decide to do harm 
Now, the owner, and think of this now, you can see where the allegory is coming into play. The owner is God, and he decides to send his son, who is Jesus. And what do they do when the son comes? Now, they think, same, if we do something to the son, if we kill him, then we'll get the, uh, we'll get the vineyard. Now, allegorically, this, they take the son outside the vineyard and kill him. You can see where allegorically this fits is a prediction of what happens to Jesus. He comes, <clears throat> he will be arrested and taken outside of the city of Jerusalem <clears throat> where he will be uh, crucified, where he, he dies. So many see this particular uh, parable as having deep, well, and so when I mentioned Christological meaning, namely the deep reflection on Jesus and how he will be treated and how he is being treated even by the leadership of his time. Now you might think, well, did the tenants, to kind of put another little piece into this story, how did they really think that they would get the inheritance if they kill the son? After all, the father's still alive. Well, then all kinds of explanations come into place. Could it be that the father was away? And therefore, they thought, well, if we kill the son, and before the father comes back, before he knows what happens, we will uh, be able to get this uh, inheritance. Um, that could be a possibility. But you see, and what you had to do, there was the fact that if the, if the owner, or the owner's sons or family, were not uh, uh, available, and the property remained unused for at least three years, then those who wanted to could make a claim to it. Now, again, we mix history here a little bit with uh, allegory. The history is that that was known to, to be the case, but in this uh, kind of case, you scratch your head and think, um, the owner seems to be around, not on any trip, <clears throat> and to execute the, the son is to put themselves in a terrible position, which is uh, what happens. So the moral and, and uh, aspect of the story is a parable, as you can see, is that they are not they, meaning the leadership, is not paying attention to what Jesus is saying or doing. They are not listening to the prophets. Now, who are the prophets here? Well, as I mentioned, it would be the Baptist and perhaps the apostles themselves, although that's not all that clear. But if you think about this as being a story that is remembered and developed by Matthew, I have to say here, that those who um, are looking for original parables of Jesus uh, question this one a little bit as to whether or not, certainly Jesus would have, could have used one like this, but that it is much more effectively being used by Matthew in his uh, claim to the leadership of his time, that they were not paying attention to the message and that of, of the gospel and that they were not interested and that they may have been causing problems for fellow uh, Hebrews who believed in Jesus. So all of that, <clears throat> all of that uh, lies behind uh, this particular uh, uh, parable. So um, with that in mind, uh, and, and uh, you, you could see, uh, is going back a moment to uh, that one from Isaiah, where <clears throat> when Israel refuses to uh, pay attention to God, God in effect says, let it go to pot. Let, let it, the hedge fall, let the grapes go. <clears throat> and uh, 
it's the difference here, I, I want to make this little point, the difference here between Isaiah and Matthew's story is that in uh, Isaiah, it is the vineyard that goes and, is, and, and kind of falls apart. In Matthew's account, it is the tenants who are the ones who receive the emphasis here, not the vineyard. The vineyard of God continues, and the vineyard of God <clears throat> is now what those who hear this story, uh, the author or the teller of the story, hopes will pay attention to. So there is the vineyard story. Uh, grapes again, notice how often that becomes really a part of the, um, <clears throat> of, of the message. Well, with the remaining time that we have, a quick little look at the little section of Paul uh, to the Philippians. Um, again, you remember that Philippi was a important city uh, at the time of uh, Paul. Uh, many, as we mentioned last time, from uh, Roman veterans who had been part of wars or battles that had taken place around Philippi, settled there, and also a number of Italian farmers had retired there. So that made Philippi rather uh, wealthy in uh, a number of ways. But the little section chosen for our consideration this week pictures Paul as saying, be careful about the virtues that are important to live by. Now, in the ancient, in the Greco-Roman uh, world, of which certainly Paul was a part, there's always a contrast between virtues and vices. And Paul is saying here, don't necessarily reject the virtues that are part of the culture that we live in. Perhaps there is something here <clears throat> of importance for us. Virtues were to be considerate of others, to be careful of how one treated one's neighbor. <clears throat> the Romans believed in these values. Sometimes we think that the society of the world of, uh, that Jesus and Paul grew up in <clears throat> was so corrupt. No, it had its values and its virtues. But Paul stresses the ones that are in the society of his time that are worth paying attention to, like goodness, mercy, and forgiveness. Now, of course, in a typical Christian way, Paul says, well, all of this can be summarized by remembering the essential quality of love. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, in, in that sense, you can see Paul, and I mention this because the letter to the Philippians is considered to be one of the first letters of Paul uh, that we have, or what we know as authentic letters. And already he is stressing the importance of love of God as well as love of neighbor. This, of course, becomes highlighted as we listen to the Gospels, but it seems to have been a kind of pattern that was very important throughout the first century world as far as believers in Jesus were concerned. Wouldn't that be, uh, perhaps as someone would update it into our 21st century, <clears throat> where division seems to be so much a part of our culture? And that was a concern that Paul had with the Philippian community. Don't be so divided. Work together with the qualities or virtues that are important, that you grew up with, he says, that I grew up with. This tension in Philippi, uh, of, and it wasn't that of Christians against others, but it was Christians against one another. There was a real concern of Paul, and that's where his admonition or his advice, let love be the glue that draws us together, that gives us a sense of meaning and a sense of direction. Added to this, of course, as I mentioned, goodness, mercy, and forgiveness. So be wise to evaluate among yourselves, Paul would say to the Philippians, those qualities that build community, not those, and there's where the vices come in, and they all knew them, they all knew the vices that could be divisive, but let the virtues 
and let the most guiding virtue of love truly be at work among you and among us. True to the Philippian community of the first century, true to the Christian community, is it not, of the 21st century. Thank you for being with me and with us, and we hope to see you again.